Thank you for coming. Um, one point of housekeeping. I'm Grace Dent, by the way. One point of housekeeping. If you would like to ask Ben a question, please do so via the festival app. Now, we've set aside an extended period of time at the end for as many of those as possible, but they need to come through the app. That's the one rule. It's a rule. That's the rule. Don't go breaking the rules. The man sitting next to me right now is one of the most instinctive ideas men in the business. He is renowned for telling it like it is mm -hmm. and for responsible for masterminding a remarkable turnaround at Channel 5 where they have never enjoyed a better reputation with the indies and with the critics and with the viewers. Um, but there has always, there's also been challenges along the way. My first very quick question is, what's going on at Channel 5? But then I'm also not allowed to let you answer it because we've got to have a look at a little <laughs> highlight of um, highlights of Channel 4. Channel, so That's it, everyone. Start. Great start. Everyone does highlights. it. Highlights, do they do it? Yeah. Highlights It'll change. Channel 5 right now. I decided I, I suffer from pre-ratings anxiety mm. and post-ratings depression. <laughs> Um, <laughs> What's the sweet spot then? Well, this, well, there is no sweet spot. It, uh, the real sweet spot, I was saying to a group of uh, young people yesterday, the real sweet spot is when it's so bad that you've got nothing to lose and you can rip the whole thing up without, without fear of failure. Uh, the, uh, the most agonizing bit is when you've had a really successful run like we just had and then you're starting to hit the autumn and the money's a bit tighter and the competition's a bit tougher and you go, okay, this is where we have to dig even deeper. We thought it was tough before. Do you sleep well? I sleep well in my, in my bed last night. I did sleep well. I sleep better if I don't drink so much. <laughs> it's a really good tip, actually. It's a really good tip. If you stop drinking at nine and then you can have a, you know, a, like a good bo bottle of water before you go to bed, you sleep really well. Do you think if you people... keep drinking up until when you go to bed, you don't sleep so well. Do people booze too much in the TV industry? I do. Because I, I, yeah. because I think... Genuinely, and it started off from when I was in theatre, you know, when you're working really hard and you go home and you're always thinking, you know, there's not a, I set myself a challenge coming up, up on the train from London, you know, how many ideas can I think of before I can get to Edinburgh? So, you know, Gosh. you're reading the papers, you're watching Succession, you're looking at the posters in the train stations, you're going, is that an idea, is that an idea? Okay, Ben, you've got an hour to think of 10 royal documentaries that you can do, go now, <laughs> you know. And then, when, so when you get home yeah. at night, you kind of go... I just need to come down really quickly and set so a very strong vodka and tonic and just go, oh, now I can breathe. And then you kind of go, now I can relax. We were talking about succession. Yeah. That, um, that kind of I know that, who I am. Who I know who you? my team I'm fucking Logan. <laughs> yeah. Surrounded by a load of young people all trying to like, you know, get the better of me and prove that I'm past it and uh, take my crown. And my job is to be, <laughs> my job is to prove that I'm still the best and I'm still clever than men and I can still suss them out and I'm still ahead of the curve. That's my job. And they, and they, they you know, the team I have, you know, my, my nine commissioners, uh, they're a really mixed bunch of people. And, and it's a really diverse mix of, 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 of opinions and thoughts and energies. And part of the reason for having the mix I have is because this time last year, I thought, how do we keep evolving? How do we stay ahead of the game? I need to up my game. If we keep just doing what we're doing, we're just going to die. You know, so I need new blood, new ears, new thinking, new challenges. And sometimes I, I hear them talking and I think, oh, fuck me, I've let Pandora's box, you know, I've opened up Pandora's box. They're so much cleverer than I am. I wish I hadn't done it. I wish I hadn't hired them. And then I go, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and then I go, but that's what you wanted. Yes. Because they are going to make you up your game. And when you're my age in a young business, you've got to keep upping your game to stay relevant and staying you know, important and, and, and staying at, at, you know, at the top. When I said I was going to come and do this, people said to me, you will really enjoy this because he is different. In a, the, nice, in a nice way. They, they all yeah. meant not, they all meant it in a way. nice way. How do, yeah. you, what, how do you think that they meant it? You're a well, different I, type I, I, of Well, I think I'm different because I'm, I'm not political. You know, I don't play the game. I don't, I don't network. I don't, um, I'm, not, I'm not really a TV person. You know, I like TV as a medium of... of um, uh, creativity and I like because I come from a theatre background I think mm. whether you're entertaining uh, an audience in a theatre or whether you're entertaining viewers at home you know I, I went to Cornwall over the summer and it's a tiny little regional theatre 
And I was saying to my partner, well, maybe if we bought that theatre, you know, you could do the designing and what would we put on as our first season? Well, we'd need a Shakespeare. And then Which we'd, one? We'd do, well, it would Midsummer Night's Dream probably because it was summertime. Um, but, you know, we'd, but we'd only do it with a cast of six people and we'd, you know, set it in you know, Egypt or something like that. And, it, and I love that idea of, and it's what we do at Channel 5. You take what people know, what you think will resonate or you think they're interested in or you think that will have a, uh, an impact on their life or bring them an emotion or something like that. And you go, right, how do, we, how do we position that in a way that feels new and fresh and different? Because there are only so many ideas and there's only one Egypt and there's only one Rome and there's only one Henry VIII. So you do keep going around the same old subjects. The challenge is to try and do it in a different way each time so that we and the audience are excited. In the last 12 months, um, and this is, the, this is without Big Brother, Mm. In the last 12 months, what's your biggest regret? Uh, what is my biggest regret? Well, I, actually, I do have a regret, but I, I, I... Ben didn't want to know the question. No, I don't know any of the questions, Absolutely. so I'm not in, so I'm not in control not of this. Uh, my biggest regret is um, sharing too much. Uh, I, it, we are in a... Yeah, with, with certain people. We're in a very, very, very competitive environment. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, our competitors are richer and they have more people. And I, I, I regret sharing a little. You know, I'm a very open person. Do you mean sharing in interviews? No, I mean, I mean in sharing things? in terms of my strategy, my thinking, my personality, the way I work, uh, the way I interact with my team. That kind of, uh, you know, Channel 5 has a really unique dyna dynamism. We sit very closely together. Uh, we, we all sit together. We all talk together. We all share everything. I'm very open and honest with my team about anything and everything. Um, and I really like that, and I don't have an office anymore, and I, I think being out on the floor is really magical. I think that we... You don't have we an bounce office? Off, no, I we, did not know this. No, we bounce off each other, and, uh, and you know, someone's having a conversation, we go, there's something in that, let's commission it, we'll have, I want two of them by Friday. And, you know, that sort of instinctiveness is really, it's one of our greatest assets. Uh, 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 and uh, I think when, yeah, I kind of wish that I hadn't shared that with some people who now have that knowledge. I if I'm truthful. I sense uh, an, a real uh, changing audience of late. Am I right? Is the audience changing in, in who they are? Yeah, the audience is changing in that we are much less obsessed by young people. Um, we've changed the way that we've sold our demos uh, and we're much more interested in um, upmarket people and, and a mature audience. Um, I think there is a place for young people on digital channels, but you know, trying to snare a young person nowadays is really goddamn hard. And... Um, uh, I, I kind of, in a way, have never really worried about the demos so much because I've always believed that, and especially in this new world order where there are so many challenges, uh, so many channels and so many options for people, at the end of the day, it just comes down to content. I'm not sure viewers really know what channels they're watching, what they know is content, what they know is a great series that their friends have talked about or that they've read about or they've heard about or that they've found um, and that they then share. Um, but definitely our audience is more at market. Uh, definitely it is, uh, I think our programming is much more intelligent. I think if you look at the faces we have on the channel now, you know, the Paxmans, Esther Ransom, the Portillos, you know, the Palins of this world. Uh, I'm not saying that this, there's work to be done. It's, it's, it's alarming how few women there are out there that you can really bring to a channel and make a statement. I think that's a really interesting discovery of the last few months. Um, so there's work to be done on all that kind of stuff, but definitely our audience is more upmarket, and, and I'm, I'm kind of happy in that zone. So no longer, so you, you're not chasing youth, you're not chasing I, I, youth no audience. point chasing anything. Uh, I can't run I mean, fast enough moment. to chase anything. I think you just, look, I think you just have to do, is it a good idea? Do we believe people will come? How can we make it in a way that will make people find it, like it, enjoy it, be rewarded by it? And then you do it. I do think we have do huge amounts- Do you want to be cool? No. You don't, so don't want to be, be cool. That must be really hard work to be cool. Oh, I mean, I would argue, I'd like to be different. I'd argue that the, uh, at the moment the BBC desperately want no, a young audience and they, they you know, I, I, don't I have work them. for the BBC, you they see, look, we want if, to be cool. If you're going to go sort of like randomly fishing and chucking stuff out there to try and attract young people, that costs a lot of money. Mm. I don't have that kind of money. I've got 200 million. Same budget essentially I had seven years ago when I came to the channel. You know, so really you've got to think about how you're going to spend that money and you've got to be pretty sure you're going to get a return on investment. And you're going to be pretty sure that program is going to work. There's only a limited room for failure when you have a limited amount of money and you have all those slots to fill and you're competing. So you kind of, 
you know, you can take the odd risk here and there, and it can be a bit of a funny one. You know, people like Puss, Zityar, or, you know, Hot Yoga, Hot Body, or whatever. You can have these fun pieces, yeah. but really, you've got to put most of the money on something that is, is pretty much going to deliver for you in some form or other, whether it's ratings or revenue or reputation. I'm going to go um, to a clip that I don't think you've. I don't think you've asked to see this clip. I haven't either. seen anything. Haven't I don't know the question. I haven't seen the clip. You are a bit I like winging it. Two. It's more two, fun. Yeah. Two years ago, you very bravely put yourself in the therapist's mm. chair. Yeah. Last year, we uh, got an insight into your team. Yeah. And this year, you've agreed to give us an insight into your audience. I went to meet me audience and find out a bit more about who watches Channel 5 uh, or not <laughs> in the case of Darren and Ruth. Uh, with, without any <laughs> further Pipe ado, Arnish. shall we see Ben Frow yeah, meet his audience? Yeah. What was that like? Oh, it was really, it was really interesting. I, I tell you the big lesson I learned from it and, and Ruth was, was <laughs> Ruth really... She watches everything on Channel 4. It was, it was, a bit, it was quite funny, actually. Um, the, but the interesting thing, the real bit I took away from it was when he says that he, he looks at the EPG. And he looks at one of those EPGs where it's just a little band on the bottom and it just goes BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, and then it just stops. He doesn't look at that big blue page. We, we got him to look at the big blue page because I said, if you look at the big blue page and you see what's around Channel 5 and you go along and look what's on later on in Channel 5, suddenly she was going, oh, Inside World's Toughest Prison. Oh, I'd watch that. Can you record it for me? Oh, you know, all that crime thing at five past 12. Oh, I'd like that. Can you record it for me? And I, I said to them, you know, if you look at what's around, there is a lot of choice out there. You will find things that you like more. But people, quite understandably, um, they don't want to make the effort or so much effort of, you know, trawling, 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 trawling. So you find something, you know, I go on to Radio Times and I, I scroll and I go, what are on the main channels? And if it does nothing I like, I might go, well, then I'll go um, iPlayer or then I'll go Harbour, then I go Netflix or then I go whatever it is. And suddenly you can find yourself 20 minutes later, you're still looking for something to watch. Mm -hmm. The clock's ticking and it's bedtime in a few hours and it's like, you know, it's not really working. So how do we get under people's noses as quickly as possible? How do we... Um, make ourselves uh, more, more f at the forefront of their thinking and, and their sort of um, what is viewing the, habits. So well, I, I realise the importance of, of marketing and press. You know, I can make the best programmes in the world. I can have the biggest programming budget in the world. But if I'm not putting enough money behind the people who have to go and tell people about us... That was very interesting. They're never going to know Saturday where they're Saturday supplements. I, I, I know. I didn't... Yeah, she reads the Times su Saturday supplement, which is a good Saturday supplement. But, yes. And that... And, and that she looks at the listings and, she, and picks of the day, influence. That's what, very what, old that, school. It is I, old school. But, you know, nowadays you can't say I'm ignoring old school. There's a lot of people who do the old school way. By the time I left the Guardian Guide writing about television, I didn't think that we had that impact anymore. I thought that things had moved on, so that surprised me. I think you can't negate or, or, or ignore anybody. We've got to be able to cover all bases. Every viewer is precious. And we need to, as I say, we need to bring as many people in as possible to the channel. Can I shift very quickly uh, just to the impact of Big Brother, losing Big Brother over this last year? Can you talk about that? Just yeah. What? Well, I, I, I was very open about um, I thought it was time to lose Big Brother from the channel. It was a very expensive program. Um, but in, was, were in, you frightened? Was no, this... I was absolutely, it was like a liberation. Um, because, because it was a very expensive show, but also it had had its day. You know, don't get me wrong, it was an incredibly valuable programme at one time, but it no longer was. Everything is cyclical, and the time had come to rest it. And, and, and in terms of our reputation, in terms of the schedule, in terms of wanting to try new things, in terms of our evolution, it was important that we, it, um, that we face a future without something that was taking up 17 weeks of the year. Is it rested or is it dead? Uh, look, you, nothing is ever uh, rested, uh, dead, dead forever, you know, but um, I have no plans to bring it back in the short term. Where did the money go? Well, some of the money went on the bottom line. It's very tough out there. The advertising market is brutal. Brexit is of a big concern to us, frankly. Um, we decided to put more money into drama and commission more dramas than we ever thought that we were going to do. Um, I think we've been a bit more ambitious with... Uh, uh, our factual programmings, we can be slightly more um, luxuriating in, our, in, in budgets that we're spending on people. Um, but actually, you know, the Big Brother money didn't go as far as I'd like it to have gone, in tr truth be told. Mm. You know, I've got, I had something like 220 hours of television to fill, and that's a lot of hours. Has anything hours. Uh, completely surprised you on the channel this year? Well, I think you're always surprised. You know, you're surprised in a good way and a bad way. You're surprised by something like 
you know, trawl them. And that is true. You know, I, it was, it was a, you know, an all fair play to Adrian who commissioned it. You know, I resisted it. I resisted it. He persuaded me to do it. I never really believed in it. I, so people can change your mind, even if you are very negative about it. Well, I, I, think, I think you have to, um, yes. And I think part of my job is to allow people to take responsibility for their actions. So I sometimes say to the team, you can do this the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is to just do what I say. The hard way <laughs> is to do it the way that you want to do it, and I will prove you wrong. And now, nine and a half times out of ten, I go back and I go, I told you it wouldn't work. Are there any... But Trawlerman was one of those ones, and, I, and I'm going to take a little bit of the credit, because with the team, <laughs> the, I, think, I think the scheduling of it did help. But it, I couldn't really understand why people would watch it. Um, Are there any but, subjects but, that but they would... But fair play to Adrian, he got it right. And, I, and I, I, I took delight in saying to him, you can have a week of, of looking down at me and jeering me <laughs> and reminding me how you were right and I was wrong and then we need to let this one lie, because, you know. In the, in the open plan office, is there any subjects that you just... nobody would dare mention to no. you because you don't... I mean, I work in, I've worked no. in newsrooms where you just have some subjects there. No, we talk just, politics. Don't, you we know, talk don't come to me with the Brexit, subject of something talk, about cycling because I don't no, want to hear it. Cycling's a big subject. I did, in fact, I did a cyclist a cycling program recently, which is uh, very good because uh, I've got a bit of a problem with cyclists. Sorry, everybody. Um, so uh, no, we're, we're always, you know, just in the conversations, we're always joshing around. We're looking at what other people are doing. We're looking at what people are reading. We sort of share books. We get onto, you know, one of my big things for next year is is. Um, because I've just read um, Song of Achilles by uh, Madeleine Miller, which is fantastic. And then followed it up with Circe, also by Madeleine Miller. And then I bought it for some of the team going on holiday. So next year, we're going to look at the ancient Greeks and their influence on the modern world, as told by Bethany Hughes as she goes on Odysseus's Odyssey. Because <laughs> I read those books, and we're, talking about, and we're all talking about Greek myths and Perseus and blah, blah. I'm going, how can I put that on? What's the way to put that on television? with the aim of giving viewers that same fantastic kind of big feeling I have inside when I read that book and the majesty of the Greek gods and Greece and history and the world and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that the, the stars are still in the sky and that's where they were sent to if they were behaved well or whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, Bethany Hughes, and I mentioned it to Bethany and Bethany goes, that's the subject she's always wanted to do. And you go, oh my God, Bethany Hughes, and she's a classicist and Greek gods and on a boat and with that magnificent well, then I'm going to circle back oh, around to wonderful. something that I just I didn't get around to asking you. So yes, you have Bethany Hughes, you have Michael Palin, you have Jeremy Paxman. Do you is this a sign that the snobbery towards your channel has now gone? Well, I think I think one of the little frisons of the last year was when Jeremy Paxman emailed me asking, <laughs> suge suggesting a program to be on the program. It's not like we went and had to pay him a lot. Talk of money me through that when the email he arrived. He emailed said, "Do you think there's something in?" how bad our politicians are and how crap they are. And I went, yeah, I think there is. He goes, mm, maybe there isn't. And I said, no, no, I think there is. You know, I think it'll rumble on, da 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 uh, And that was like, he was actually emailing me. I mean, I've never met him. How I hear he's quite frightening. He's, but, I mean, Jeremy, who How long did it you like... leave it before you replied? Oh, I, I don't... I... Did you play it cool? No. Like a day? Fucking Jeremy Paxman, no! <laughs> It's Jeremy Paxman. You just strike while the iron's bloody hot. No, I went straight back. I mean, as I'm, everyone knows I'm obsessed by replying very quickly. Um, so that was a, that was a, re a real thrill. On the downside, when I had to move um, the Michael Portillo programme because of, there was a, a by-election, we were not allowed to play it. He was so angry with me. He wrote this long email, which was... I, I couldn't even read it. it was, mm. I, I just knew it was a bad email. And I said to Sebastian, I said, is this email as bad as I think it is? He said, yeah, it's as bad as you think it is. It's just like, oh, my God, you know. Uh -huh. How do you start to repair those kind of relationships when... How do you a, repair that? Well, you, you basically get Guy Davis to go and um, clean up the mess because <laughs> uh, he was the commissioning editor for it. Um, that's what you do. Do you take them out for a delicious, No, I've never, met, I've never met most of my talent. Yeah. I've never met Jeremy Paxman. I've never met Michael Pacella. Why not? Uh, I don't really like talent. I, 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 I like... <laughs> well, I don't really like... I'm not very good at, you know, blowing the smoke up the arse and kind of, uh, you know, crawling and kind of going, oh, you're amazing. I like just having conversations. You know, yeah. Bethany's great, because the first thing I said when I met Bethany was, do you like a drink at lunchtime? She said, do I just? And it's like, <laughs> it's going to be a good, a good old lunch. And, you know, I, you know, I like to do lunches when it's social and when it's fun and you can just have a nice time. The pressure of, you know, am I going to get it right? Am I going to, you know, lose them? Am I going to get them across the line? There are other people commissioning editors, production companies, who are much better at that. And I, I'm a great believer in whether it's getting talent across the line or directing or producing or working on the budgets or making television or whatever it is, you let people do their jobs. And 
people are better at it. So let them do that. I'm happy to make the decision. I'm happy to write a note. I'm happy to have a conversation if they want me to. But I, I, if I'm not needed to, I would rather let people who are better at it do it. So going back to the snobbery, has the snobbery gone? Uh, I, I, think, I think a lot of it's gone. Um, uh, I think that it, there will always be a, a, a slight smell out there f f for some people. Why? Um, because that's just the way they are. Uh, I think there's a, you know, if I'm truthful, I think a lot of it's jealousy. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at what we do and how we do it with who we have and the limited money that we have, I think we punch way above our weight, I believe. Talk about the successes because that we, we should talk about that now. You're, you're, you've had some amazing successes over the last Well, I think, months, I, I think you know, you know, you know it, it's a balance, isn't it? It's, it's always been, you need returnable shows that can deliver the numbers and bring the viewers in. They drive the revenue. Then you want the pieces that are big and exciting and that are changing the dial, that are creatively different, that show that we lead, we don't follow. If you get those right and you're bringing in enough money, you can then do, which I think is almost the biggest privilege of all, which is being able to clear the schedule and go, let's devote a night to sexual abuse or let's devote a night to um, domestic abuse. Or in the autumn, we're doing a whole night where we look at suicide. You know, it's not about ratings. It's not about revenue. It's about, about being responsible and going, we have an opportunity with our channel of talking to millions of people what a difference can we make to those people? How can we help them, encourage them, support them, enlighten them, whatever? Uh, and it was interesting, when we did The Abused, um, we followed it up with a half hour program on, called How to Leave Your Partner Safely. Half a million people watched that. Half a million people watched a program about how to leave their partner safely. That implies to me that a lot of people want to maybe leave their partner safely. Mm -hmm. If one or two or three people from that night of television went, I've had it, I'm now gonna get out of this abusive relationship, what a fantastic achievement. Um, and, and so, thank you. And I take that very seriously. And I think with suicide, if, 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 um, if one person decides not to kill themselves, or if one person gets awareness that maybe they've got somebody in their lives or in their family who is troubled and might kill themselves, and they manage to stop that, that will be an achievement. And then next year, we're looking at bereavement, because I think grief and bereavement are never really spoken about in this country. We're looking at miscarriage. And again, we will clear the schedules because I believe as a public service broadcaster, it's not just about, I've got my hours in for Ofcom, I've ticked the box. We have a responsibility to entertain, to engage with people, but we also have, we have a very privileged position where we can change lives. And look, don't get me wrong, I loved, I loved winning Channel of the Year last year. I was incredibly proud for the team because I think it was a, a justifiable reflection of a reward for what we'd achieved. But actually the greatest reward I got was when we won an award from the RSPCA from the difference that we had made through the dog rescuers mm. in terms of helping animals who are less fortunate because that's it's making a difference. So if you can combine the ratings and the revenue and the reputation and then make a difference as well, a pretty good job, right? I'm going to move on to uh, drama on the channel, but beforehand, just indulge me for a moment and tell me about Jane McDonald and cruising. Well, uh, you know, as I, as I was Which saying... Which is enormous in the Dent household. <laughs> My mother, as I was saying to you, loves Jane much more than me. Yeah, yeah. And would swap us in a heartbeat. <laughs> that's, that's slightly worrying. <laughs> um, uh, well, as I was saying, you know, when I came up here on the train and I'm trying to, you know, how many ideas can I think of? And, da -da -da -da, and ideas are everywhere. You just look around, you listen to a conversation. You've always, you know, if you're, if especially in production, you're always the antenna, antenna around. And we don't do anything really new. Let's be really honest. There are new, new ideas, you know, uh, I, I almost pride ourselves on the fact that we, our viewers know what they're going to get, but we give it to them in a new way, and then we reinvent it all over again. But there's a familiarity there. And, you know, there was, there was cruising on ITV, there was cruising on the BBC. What's, we know cruising works, therefore we'd like a slice of that pie. What's our take on cruising? And it was walking the dogs. And the simplest ideas are always the best ideas. And some people have heard this story. I was walking along and I went, God, Jane McDonald, she was on a cruise. Oh, She's from Wakefield. Isn't Wakefield in Yorkshire? Oh, our biggest audience is in Yorkshire. Jane MacDonald, Yorkshire, cruising, and at the end she sings a song. Yeah. That's the show. <laughs> I mean, that was the show. <laughs> and everyone sort of went, let's drip, let's ditch the song bit. But I went, no, but that's the bit, that, that's the Ben Frow bit. That's the bit that is, yeah. only Ben would have Jane MacDonald do a little video at the end yeah. where she sings a song. Yeah. Um, and then we released a CD on it. And it's actually a really good CD. I would recommend it. It's got great songs on it. Um, <laughs> so, 
Jane sort of came about, I mean, she needed to be persuaded. She wasn't naturally inclined to come to Channel 5 at the time. Mm. Uh, now I like to think, because I pay her a lot of money, she likes being at Channel 5. Mm. And I bought her a very nice Prada handbag. Um, did so, you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's nice to reward talent. We all yeah. like to be loved, don't we? We all need... We all need to be praised. We all need to know that we're special. We all need to feel valued. Did you we... choose it? No, actually, I would have chosen a different one. Okay. Her style is not my style. <laughs> but it's the one she wanted. And sometimes it's best just to give people what they want. Oh, I just want to talk about Jane for the next 20 minutes. But uh, I hope that you're all sending questions in. We're going to move to your questions very soon. We're going to go to drama. So you um, you seem to be moving further into yeah, drama, yeah. following the success and again, of it's Blood, 15 yeah. Days. Several yeah. dramas, including um, All Creatures Great and Small. It's, it's, look, it's really which weird. It's magical to Sometimes me. Sometimes you just have to open up the... Um, Open up your life. When I first, when I first said, you know, we're sort of thinking of moving into drama, but you know, it's going to be low cost drama. Uh, I didn't think we'd get many uh, much interest, um, and it really came about because Sebastian, one of the commissioners, said at the time he wanted to be a scriptwriter, and I said, oh, you want to be a scriptwriter? Well, maybe you should look after drama because that would be good experience for you. So let's just do drama. So we have no drama department. We have no editors or anything. We have Sebastian, who also looks after a number of other you channels. You have no cetera, drama cetera. department. No, we just have Sebastian and, and me, and we sit next to each other and we go, <laughs> you know, and he walks in one day and goes, oh, what about bringing back All Creatures Great and Small? And then two days later, we got an email from them going, oh, we were going to do a pilot for the BBC, but, you know, we want to do a series. Would you do a series? And we went... Did that link in with the Yorkshire... Uh... Yorkshire Vet? Yeah. Well, the Yorkshire Vet was our factual version of All Creatures Great mm. and Small. Yeah. It's like, I'm eating myself now. It's like all our programmes are kind of devouring each other. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's like, pe people now know that, OK, our money is limited, but we're a broadcaster. We work very quickly. Um, you know, I, I sent an email out to Sarah Gator a few months ago. I said, oh, Sarah, I think we might need a few more dramas, actually. You know, have you got anything? She said, I'll see you at 4.30 tomorrow. She came up with eight ideas. We'll take that one, that one, that one, and we'll have a conversation about that one. You know, bish, bash, bosh. You know, met the producers, bish, bash, bosh. You know, sometimes we go a little too quickly. Uh, sometimes we make the drama and then we look at the ending and go, um, OK, I'm not quite sure this works. How much can you do in additional dialogue uh, recording? And, uh, you know, and it's quite fun. But, you know, the idea is, is that we work quickly. <laughs> we try to sort of... <laughs> you know, cover on, we know our audience. We know how we want to schedule them. I think there's room for more. I, you know, we've had conversations, Sebastian and I, about, you know, the diversity within the drama so that, you know, we want to have texture. We can't just keep doing Nightmare Nannies and Serial Killers and, you know, Who Murdered Who. Uh, valuable though they are. And, you know, and again, it's, it's creativity with strategy. When you've got I'm a Celebrity against you, when you've got a summer of sport, when the other people and the other channels are not playing drama, there is an audience who really like their drama. So we just jump in there and give the audience what they want when other people aren't providing it. We would never play drama when ITV and BBC are doing a drama. That would be suicide because they've got more money, they've got bigger drama, etc, etc. But um, if you, th there's a room for everything in the schedule if you're strategic about where you play it and how you play it and you're very mindful of the competitors and what they're doing and you simply avoid the juggernauts. You know, entertainment's tough for us at the moment because there's a lot of entertainment on the channels at the beginning of the year. So Gino and Blind Date, which would naturally have played in January on a Saturday, we had to, we had to literally park them at 24 hours notice. Why? And then it was like, because there was so much entertainment on other channels, they would never have come to Channel 5. So we go, what are we going to do? And what we did was we looked back at what we'd done in the past with history, and we took all our old history and we reversioned it all. And we basically created brand new Saturdays on nothing but old footage and creativity, mm -hmm. which I think is one of our, I mean, it's given us a really successful year. Um, and you start to understand the value of a program that you can play and you can reversion and you can use at seven o'clock or eight o'clock or nine o'clock or stacked on a Saturday against the competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we love our drama. It has its limitations and it has a limited price. Um, let me uh, ask you about Cold Call. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Cole, Cole. actually, we've got a clip. Should we watch the clip? Yeah, first? Of course, yeah, yeah. Should we go to the clip, please. Gosh. So that came about because um, we were at the launch of Will and Grace, actually, and because uh, I don't go meet anybody. Sally Lindsay came up to me and said, "Are you Ben Frown?" I said, "Yes, I am. Are you Sally Lindsay? You're mm -hmm. nice to meet you." She said, "Do you want me to do a comedy?" I said, "No, not really." And she said, um, <laughs> "Is there anything you'd like me to do?" And I said, "Well, I'd like you in a drama, but only if you're going to play against type." 
uh, and and sort of not someone who's sort of like naturally funny and that kind of thing. And Seb and, and Chalkboard, who, who made it, sort of built it around her. We sort of created it from scratch, really, around Sally Lindsay. And the story is, you know, she's a, a, a carer who gets fleeced. She loses all her money and uh, through circumstances wheedles her way into the sort of, you know, the, the, the main man's house to take care of his elderly mother and then brings them down from within. It's a, it's a revenge drama, yeah. Yeah, she gets her revenge and, and maybe she gets her money. You look like you really like it yourself. Oh, I love I thought the first episode was fantastic. And then um, we had a lot of conversations about the end. <laughs> I think they went a bit rogue when they were actually filming it and decided to shoot their own ending, so we had to sort of uh, wrestle it back a bit, yeah. But, but you know what? It's like, that's where you learn about drama. You know, it's like there's, there's two of us and these production companies who are so fantastic making this great content. And, you know, we're not a big professional team. We're not one of the big guns out there. We're not paying billions of pounds per episode, blah, 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 blah. So let's just keep it in perspective. We have a lot of fun. It's incredibly creative. Uh, we're deeply grateful for them. They're all really good, but some of them are a little more chaotic than, than, than others in terms of production. But with everything I've spoken about so far, I mean, do, do you like to be in the headlines? Do, do you like to be in the headlines? Do you like to see your channel in the headlines? Uh, only if they're good headlines. What would you like to see about yourself over the next 12 months? I'd like to see, about me myself personally. No, you, well, oh, I mean, no, no, no not the, yourself the, the, personally, the, the, but the oh, channel. Maybe, oh, maybe I, the I, channel, I, I, maybe well, I, I, you know, I would love to see that Channel Five kicks ass, you know, kind of thing. You know, that we, mm. you know, I'd like, I'd like us to win a few more awards because I think some of our programs really, really do deserve to be recognised. Uh, and and I, is, I and in a way, it's not really. And it's not, what is what what? I think a lot of our factual you? stuff and a lot of our history, history, history stuff and our specialist factual is underrated. I wanted um, to move on to history actually because it, I, I think that. I think that is a surprising thing in the about the channel. Tell me about the forthcoming Trump versus Henry VIII. Well, again, this is one of those, you know, I'm standing out there or sitting out there at my desk and we're musing around. And I'm going, you know what? I think Trump's the reincarnation of Henry VIII. You know, he's germaphobe. He's the second son. His elder brother died early. He's had multiple wives. He's fallen out with his enemies. Is there a program in that? And you kind of laugh about it. And I said, to Lucy, is there a program in it? Kind of thinking it's kind of a bit silly. And then it turns out that actually there really is great similarity between Trump and Henry VIII. Then you go, that's an interesting way of looking at Henry VIII. It's also quite an interesting way of looking at Trump. So Trump is not a natural fit for Channel 5 and our audience, I don't think. Is, uh, is he not? No. I don't think, Why not? Because I don't think they're really interested in American politics, our audience particularly. I think they're much more interested in, in British politics. And they're interested in Henry VIII? Oh, yes. They love the Tudors. <laughs> I mean, we're about, to do, we're about to do our third series on Anne Boleyn. And then I've already just commissioned a drama about Anne Boleyn for next year. You love the Tudors. I love Anne Boleyn. She's my... The, the best thing about this job is that... Because when I was young, I just wanted to be Anne Boleyn. There are a lot of... <laughs> there are a lot of pictures of me in a, in a sort of wimple. And I was always, always about to have my head chopped off. You know, it's why? Like, why? It's kind of like really, Anne Boleyn? Like, why Anne Boleyn? What must it be like to, I mean, to be Anne Boleyn? This woman who completely changed this country. You know, what did she have that made Henry break with the Catholic Church? And destroy the monasteries and kill Cromwell and Wolsey or whatever it was. I mean, just this, she must have been extraordinary. Just mag and then she gave birth to Elizabeth I. So she's just like an amazing woman. And again, I mean, I was always fascinated by her, but you know, everything so far that Anne Boleyn with Anne Boleyn has worked. So, you know, you did, I did uh, The Lovers Who Changed History, Henry and Anne. Then we did The Six Rides of Henry VIII. Then we did Anne of a Thousand Days. And then we're going to do uh, another series on Anne Boleyn. We, you know, same old story, but you come at it from a, a different point of view or a through a different prism. Um, I think our viewers really like, you know, especially in these very troubled times, I think, I think reassuring television is really important for our viewers at the moment. I think they want to we... know that for all the darkness out there and all the worries and all the insecurity, actually, you know what? We're going to get through it and we've been here before and the world goes on and history does repeat itself. And I know it feels a bit like sort of pre-Second World War at the moment, but then we had this wonderful time after the Second World War and it's not all going to last forever. And I think reassuring, reassuring programming is going to be very big for us next year. We talked about this before we came on stage where I, a lot of what you do reassures Britain that yeah. the infrastructure of Britain yeah. is still actually alive and kicking and there's something quite safe in that. Can you explain a bit 
more about that. We were talking about motorways. Well, I think you know, one, of, one, of, one, of the, one of the ways of looking, you know, one of the ways of looking at the familiar is to look at it then and now. So, you know, whether it's Marks and Spencers or the M1 or Heathrow Airport or you know railway lines, or whatever it is, then and now, then and now. You know, it was like that then, and now it's like this. And it reminds people of the past. Um, you know, we're talking about doing a big series on the Empire with Michael Portillo because I think you know when Britain was great, we'll really tap into our viewers because they really, our viewers really do believe that Britain will be great again. Uh, I'm not sure they're right, but yeah, that's what they believe. Um, and uh, and I think the other kind of programming is is that kind of um, life doesn't have to be all about expense accounts and luxury living. You know, our Yorkshire Farm was our probably our biggest new show of last year. You know, following the wonderful shepherdess and her nine children in Yorkshire, and uh, we're doing our Simple Life, which is similar stories about people who live off grid with their families. We've got Ben Fogel's New Lives in the Wild. We're following people as they move to Greece for a simpler life, and I think that kind of programming, when you look at people who are happy and fulfilled mm -hmm. with not an awful lot, and you go, actually, do I really need to go to Oka every weekend and buy more fake orchids? No, I don't. I can be happy. <laughs> if you haven't discovered Oka, uh, it's just like my absolute, I'm like obsessed by Oka. <laughs> I have to, hang on, I, do, I mean, I, I have to go to the website Oka. every day, OKA. Okay. Okay. It's like an interior design shop. I, mean, I just love Oka so much. <laughs> um, and you're buying orchids? I just, I buy anything from Oka. I actually, I actually went there on Saturday for an hour with the dogs, and then I went back on Sunday just because I thought I'd better have another look around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, um, anyway, but anyway, the whole point about the whole point of these programs is they're about reassuring us that actually we don't need to go to Oka or whatever in order to be happy, fulfilled people. You know, happiness well, can actually be quite a simple. Let thing. me ask you another question about Channel Five making a difference. You've championed small indies with a scheme last year, which led to yeah. four million yeah, pounds good. worth of uh, small regional Warship commissions. Came out of that, which is Warship big, big life, at sea. life at sea. Yeah. This year, you've announced a business initiative to help both small, small national and regional BAME indies yeah. get a foot through the door, yeah. working with the TV collective. Yeah. So, does can Channel Five make a difference? Oh, well, I think we can make a difference to people, uh, you know, uh, with, within our limitations. Yes, absolutely. You know, we are who we are. We're, we're the size we are. We can do what we can do. And I think, again, I like that. The, I don't do much television. I did do the um, Ones to Watch session yesterday because I believe in, you know, younger people coming up through the ranks. If you could just reassure them or inspire them or encourage them or tell funny stories or, you know, uh, remind them that it's not all going to be fun, that there are tough times, but you get through them. It is important to do. And I think if you can find... You, how hard is it to be a, a, an independent company in this world? You know, it's so competitive out there. There's so many, it's 60 BAME-led companies applied for our scheme, mm. 60. The fact that there are 60 out there is extraordinary. Mm. So these are a lot of people who are trying to get a foot in the door, who are trying to get a chance to prove that they can make television, good television. Um, and I think the least we can do with our very limited resources is to say each year, what should our initiative be? And last year, the regional initiative worked so well. I think there are about four or five companies that we ended up working with. We got two or three returning shows, which is a huge success. Uh, and if the same comes from our BAME initiative, I'll be delighted. It's, it's a drop in the ocean of what needs to be done. But you know what? Let's just do something. I think there's a bit too much talk sometime about what needs to be done and a little, a too little action in terms of just doing something. It may not make a big difference, but it will make some difference. Um. I'm going to go to questions, uh, and um, but I have one last question for you, and that is, uh, what what do you think the role of the controller is? What do you do? Uh, I take the flak. I, I, I keep the wolves at bay, uh, who, are, who 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 try to complicate things. Essentially, I think the job of a controller is to set the vision. Who are we? Where are we going? What do we want to look like? What do we want to feel like? What is important to us? What are we going to spend our money on? What are we not going to spend our money on? How do we justify everything that we do? How do we want people to talk about us? How do we want people to view us? What do we want our viewers to feel about us? And therefore, in all the ideas that come in and all the conversations that I have with the commissioning team, it's kind of like, how does that fit in with our strategy? How does that, you know, in three years' time, where do we want to be? Therefore, what do we need to do in order to get there. Therefore, what do we prioritise? Are eight o'clock returnables what we really need? Do we need statement pieces? Are we crying out for talent? How are we going to get the pieces that we need in order to be who we want to be? That's my job. It's like, it's like marshalling the troops, 
keeping everybody up when I'm feeling down. I mean, today was a tough day for me, but um, you know, I, I've got to, I've got to keep the flag flying. I've got to lead from the front. I've got to say we can get through this. I've got to say don't worry about it. Doesn't matter about last night's ratings. We keep going forward. Um, you know, sounds reward people. Sell it. That it's sounds exhausting, exhausting it's... to have to keep upbeat. Do you have to keep upbeat all the time? Well, I think probably one of the downsides for the team is that they experience the downsides as well as the. I mean, I, I, I do get grumpy and I, I do get frustrated and I do get angry. Are you a shouter? Am I a shouter? I sort of shout across the room. I don't no, shout at people, wasn't. but I sort of shout, James, what are we doing about so-and-so? You know, I do that kind of shouting. And in fact, yeah. today when we were doing Week to Press, we were in a hotel room and it was really horrible not having the whole team around you because you go, Emma, what's, what's the title of that programme? Can we change it? Lucy, can you call up so-and-so if we can do so-and-so and so-and-so? And we, you know, everyone pulls together. You know, we're a team who, we, our aim is to be the very best we can be. And as long as we are the best we can be at that time, that's all I ever ask. I'm going to go to audience questions. I don't know if anybody who's in my ear can see this and hear this, but uh, okay, somebody is listening to it. I've actually only got one question on this iPad. Nobody ever asks. But... And that question is, and I'm going to let you answer this while they mend this. It's a very highbrow question. Oh, golly. How many outfits did you try on this morning before deciding on this one? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, actually, none, because this is my new look. Um, it is... <laughs> I've discovered there's actually a pyjama top, um, and, and, and I wore this instead of a t-shirt, and everyone said, oh, it's sort of flattering. And so, and I'm kind of liking this, because my ankles are quite good. So slightly, <laughs> so I'm not all buttoned up, and I've got drawstring trousers, kind of put a bit of weight. Um, and this is my kind of like, so actually, we kind of worked it out in advance, hadn't we, with the team. I sort of, I'd got the seal of approval, and I thought, have you seen um, Verdon Fossey on BBC Two about Grace Verdon and Bob Fossey? Well, I feel I'm a bit like because of Grace Verdon. Uh, no, uh, whatever, no. Um, is, is what's she called, Grace Verdon? No, what's she called? Is it Grace Verdon? Um, Gwen Verdon, you know, rehearsing for Chicago. And my grandmother was an artist and a sculptor, and she used to wear sort of shirts and sort of, you know, ski pants. And I'm feeling it's a bit like that look for me. It's a sort of creative arty look rather you than you a talk suit. You about look. Judy Finnegan and when you were working with her. Yeah. Tell me. It was fantastic. I mean, I got to make every day a new suit for Judy, and I got to eavesdrop on an hour's editorial while Richard and Judy would rip that show apart every morning and stick it back together again. And I said when I got my RTS award last night, you know, the people who helped make me who I am were Richard and Judy from the editorial I learned from them, Tim Gardam at Channel 4 and Peter McHugh from GMTV. And I, you know, I say to my team, you know, I know that I'm a hard, I'm a hard taskmaster. I know that I, I'm very rigorous with their ideas. I know that they don't get away every single programme that they want. As I say to them, it's not really about what you want to watch, it's about what the audience want to watch. I don't really care what you want to watch. I care about what the audience want to watch. Um, but I do like to think, and I really hope that in you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years, when they are big successes within the business, doing their own thing, they will remember what they learnt by working with me. Because I do think that working at Channel 5 at the moment is a, a fantastic learning curve. I think we're all learning, I'm learning, um, but I think for the team as well, it is a great way to learn all aspects of the commissioning job in terms of making good programmes, hearing good ideas, working with production companies, managing upwards, managing downwards, working as a team collaboratively in order to be the best we can be. And I think that when they move on out into the world, I like to think there'll be lots of people saying, I remember my old boss, Ben Frau, saying, it's not really fucking about you, it's about the bloody audience, you know, and that some yeah. of the phrases I use will be passed on. I'd like that, I, I, my, you, my sort of legacy. You speak very passionately about your channel, about your team. Would you consider, one of the questions is coming, would you consider running another channel? I've never had a plan. The thing that gets me, and I've never had a plan, I've never applied for a job, but I think the bit that gets me down and the bit where I start to wobble is when I can't see how I'm going to crack it, when I can't see success. I'm, I don't like failure. I, I take failure very, very badly. And in fact, the transition period between being successful and failing is the worst. When you're right down in the depths, as I said, it's fine because the, the only way is up. Um, I've always liked the idea of, of whatever it is. It could be anything. It could be completely out of television starting again. Can I do it? How am I going to do it? So starting again rather yeah, than... building something else. I love, I love building. So that idea of the, the, the theatre and you... 
you know, going to a theatre company, what would I call it? What plays would we do? Who would we hire? What do we stand for? Who are our audience? How do we get them in? What's our, you know, USP? I think that's... But it's like products. I've always loved... I mean, I love products. I love bottles and labels and, and perfume and how they package it and what they call it and who they, who they target and why they target and when you walk around shops and, you know, what you pick up and what you ignore. And I think all that kind of understanding the customer and then using that knowledge to try and give them what they want is really exciting, whether it's dog food or whether it's beauty products or theatre or, in our case, television. I've got four minutes left and my questions have come through. But I've been told we have to get off stage quickly. Yeah, I'm yeah. not, I'm apparently we turn the room. Sorry. The question is, um, are you, this is another anonymous question, are you jealous of other shows and what show are you the most jealous of? <gasps> My absolute favourite show, which I now watch, I binge watch every afternoon from two to six, is Say, Say Yes to the Dress. <laughs> oh, my God. I love that show. I love that show so much. And do you know what? It's not just about wedding dresses. It's about all life. There's the best friend who's the absolute bitch. There's the, there's the war veteran who has, has been psychologically damaged in Afghanistan and is... And she stopped, oh my God, she kept crying because they were giving her this like, you can run around and choose anything. Well, she kept crying and I was like, oh, this is really bad, she's awful. And in the end, I was crying because her genuine appreciation and joy at being able to give, being given her dream wedding dress was fantastic. There's the mother-daughter relationship. It is the most fantastic program. He said, ask you anything. What's the worst show you've commissioned? <laughs> oh God. What is the worst show I've commissioned? Oh, I've commissioned, I've commissioned stuff that I just, I, I, it'll be a 10 o'clock something that I shouldn't have done, you know. You know, it'll be a commissioner banging on and banging on and banging on and banging on. And you go, OK, we'll do it. OK, we'll do it. It's never going to work in a million years. I know I'm wasting £100,000. I know I'm going to regret this. I know I'm not going to want to change it. But if it'll shut them up just for five fucking minutes, OK. <laughs> go on. Because sometimes you just got to give them enough rope for them to hang themselves. Um, and occasionally, as Adrian did, they proved me wrong. <laughs> and I like being proved wrong. Does Channel 5 create the audience, or does the audience create Channel 5? Oh, I, I, that's, very, that's a very interesting question. This I might think, have to be my last question. I think, I think we have... I think we've been quite unique in that we've managed to keep our traditional Channel 5 audience and evolve them to a wider kind of uh, diversity of schedule and a wider range of programmes and more upmarket programmes without, but also at the same time, bringing in new viewers to Channel 5. And I think that that is quite an achievement because every single viewer is precious. And I don't care what age they are or what size they are or where they live or what their demographic is, every viewer is precious and you turn away a viewer at your peril. I want to thank you all for coming it's been such an amazing turnout i want thank to you. uh thank our sponsors broadcast magazine and the biggest thanks of all goes to ladies and gentlemen thank you. Ben thank you thank you, thank you.